third is Suarez. Goodell comes running in. He's under it, makes the catch. Here's the throw to the plate. It's in the air. He is And welcome back to the Stupid Money Podcast. We get to do a, uh, a Stupid Money episode because the Phillies opened up the checkbook for Aaron Nola. Um, I, we're, we'll get into this a little more. I, I think the timing is kind of interesting, but uh, th- this comes about on Sunday, uh, what right before noon, I believe this broke. In the morning mm-hmm. hours, there were some tweets that went out that they re-engaged in talks and usually when everyone starts tweeting that stuff it usually means something is kind of on the horizon coming everyone's just trying to drop a little hint out there and they're getting kind of obvious honestly as the morning went on but seven years 172 million for the 30 year old who i believe turns 31 during the season or by the time the season starts something uh, along those lines so uh kind of the back half of Aaron Ola's career here, but he's now on track to be the third longest tenured Philly ever if he sees the end of this contract, which is crazy. But uh just you know, your initial thoughts on this signing. I thought the AAV was good. I I don't think the Phillies originally wanted to go seven years, but uh you know, keeping the Braves out of the picture, I think had a lot to do with this too. So that you know, that's kind of my take on it. I don't know what you thought. Yeah, I obviously loved the uh, the AAV uh, for what kind of Aaron Nola's value is. I think on spot track he's kind of slotted at thirty one point two million, something along those lines. So kind of getting him for that AAV of twenty four million is somewhat of a steal for that caliber of an arm. Even kind of looking at the last year that he had, I think if you take away the end of the season more so and those adjustments that they kind of made down the stretch and especially in the postseason, like you kind of know what you're getting with Aaron Noah. I think he's tied with Garrett Cole in terms of the most 180 inning seasons going back to maybe the last four or five years. Like the guy just eats up innings. And we talked about on the last podcast, our perfect off season podcast that we kind of think that the bullpen set maybe like one more additional piece. And that almost, if you lose a guy like Nola and go with the alternative of Blake Snell, you kind of need two more pieces because that difference of 155 to 160 innings as opposed to the 200 that you could kind of pencil in that Nola is going to take down is a massive difference. You know, we've seen it the last two years specifically getting your guys fresh at the right time with Alvarado and Dominguez and those guys kind of getting right in October and September. And Aaron Nola, I think, is a a big key in that kind of machine as far as keeping the bullpen fresh. Um, I think one of the biggest surprises to me was Bob Nightingale actually getting a report (laughs) right. I think we've there's kind of been the ongoing joke the last four or five years in the the baseball circle of Bob Nightingale getting everything wrong, going back to pretty much everything. So just seeing him being the first one on the scene, kind of reporting that the talks had heated up, and then it actually coming to fruition was pretty funny. Maybe it's Bob's off season. You never know. But yeah, overall, I think it was, I was really happy when it happened. Um, I know we both kind of didn't expect it going back to what we said in the off season, but yeah. it makes sense. Um, you don't have to lose a draft pick like you would have signing Sonny Gray. Obviously you don't get that fourth round pick if you went elsewhere, but I think this prime window for your guys is kind of the next, half decade at most somewhere in that three to five year hot spot. So like you kind of have to, obviously you want the farm system to build up so we don't go into another 2010 type of <laughs> mm-hmm. drought that we did. But at, at some point you got to prioritize winning and giving a guy seven years and worrying about what 2030 looks like when 2030 comes, when you have this kind of capital put into the roster is perfectly fine by me. Yeah, uh, I have a couple of thoughts. One, I was waiting for uh, John Heyman to give a uh, Arsenola 
tweet like he screwed up judge last year but i you know you talk about the years thing and you know we'll get to 2030 when we get there. there there's a lot more pressure on this team to win a world series now because uh you know bryce harper and we're gonna get into bryce harper because some interesting stuff came up with him today actually but you know bryce harper trey turner these guys are going to be here till they're pretty much 40. now you have nola who's going to be here till he's 37 38 as a pitcher there's talk about extending zach wheeler that would probably take him until he's 37 or so the the, the bot the, these last those last years of that stuff is going to be a little ugly it, it's a lot easier for fans to stomach it with a you know a pennant uh out in the outfield a, a red one you know or, or two it's it's gonna be a lot easier for fans to be okay with a really aging roster that probably looks really bad uh i you know i doubt all those guys even make it to that point but the point is it the fans will be a little more okay with it if there was some winning that went on beforehand and you know this is just the price of winning which you look at like nfl teams like the rams and stuff like yeah. sometimes yeah, the price of winning can be a little ugly, but you don't trade it because the goal is pretty much to win in the moment, and that, that's what they're doing. But I know a little more. Uh, so he kind of corrected – you talk about this – correct a lot of things in the postseason. Obviously, the sample size is a lot smaller, but four starts, 23 innings, a 2.35 ERA, a whip under one. The whip has never really been a thing with – a problem with him, but uh, the ERA, I mean, we're talking a two-run difference from the regular season. I know his last start in the uh, NLCS wasn't exactly great, but before that he was... It wasn't bad, though. He gave up, what, the two or three runs in that one inning, and then he settled in. Like, we we talked about it in the moment. It's like, that's that's the start. You need your offense to show up. You know, you're back at home and everything. Mm -hmm. Like, five five innings, three runs. Like, obviously, that's not, you know, your, your number one kind of level guy, what you expect from him. But at the same time, like, that's a pretty good postseason start. Yeah, and since 2018, I'm not sure if he's missed a start because 2018, 33 starts. 2019, 34 starts. 2020, a 60-game season, 12 starts. So, you know, five times 12 is 60. So I don't think he missed a start yeah. there. 2021, 32. 2022, 32. This past season, 32 starts. So we're... We are talking about pretty much the most durable pitcher in baseball right now. You know, the flip side is always, you know, he's logged all these innings, like injuries could happen. Um, you know, he's due for an injury. You could say that stuff. Or, you know, the flip side is he's just a really healthy person. And, you know, the, some of those problems he had early in his career, he was getting shut down in September, those first couple of years. I think that stuff's behind him. So uh, good to see that. And kind of my last point on this is a after it came out that, Reese Hoskins, or I guess Bryce Harper was moving to first base and Reese Hoskins wasn't coming back. I, I had a hard time seeing them part with both Hoskins and Nola in the same offseason. I mean, these were kind of the two cornerstone guys that you developed yourself to brought up, that you brought up, and kind of the first glimmer of hope before Bryce Harper got here, before JT Romito got here, before Zach Wheeler got here. You know, these were kind of the guys that the fans leaned on and got really close to, especially I know Hoskins, that one hurts for a lot of people. But I just, I couldn't see them parting with him. You know, a first round draft pick, a guy that's been there doing a lot of good stuff in the community too. I just, I, I couldn't see them parting with both. I think it would have been bad with the fan connection. And I think it would have caused some problems in the clubhouse too, uh, you know, not having either of those guys next season. Yeah. And the, a lot of, the talk in sports is it's a business, it's a business, you know, don't mm -hmm. take moves personally, but especially in baseball, I feel like it's, it's so different. And obviously pitchers, not as much as position players. Cause we, you know, watch these guys for four hours a night for 162 plus a year, right. pitchers, not as many, maybe 30 or 40 times. Uh, but like, I mean, no one made his debut the week they traded Cole Hamels. So like mm -hmm. he wasn't on, he wasn't there for the heyday, obviously. But, like, he was kind of the last link that we had to those times. Like, even Hoskins came up in 2017 or 2018, mm -hmm. and he kind of led the offensive charge of what could be some sense of hope. But like, Nola was there when some guys from that era were still around. So, like, he kind of is 
that sentimental link for, for some fans, for, for a lot of fans, I think. And I mean, he's going to be, like you said, the on track to be the third longest tenured Philly. He has a full no trade clause in the contract, no opt out. So it's pretty set that that's going to be the case. But um, yeah. like he already has the third longest opening day streak. I think he, 2023 was a six straight opening day start. I don't know if that's going to be the case in 2024. If they kind of give it to Wheeler, as we've we've seen Wheeler to be a little bit more dominant. But like if it's Nola, I wouldn't be surprised. And mm-hmm. it's like by the by the time it's all said and done, he will have a lot of records here. He's going to go up in the Wall of Fame. Um, it's kind of you, you say it's a business. Don't take moves personally, but like at the same time, we've done our fair share of giving Nola a hard time you know we need him to be better in some instances but like I feel like that's just a guy that when it when it comes down to it I think that's a guy that we want on our side and you know the the Players Tribune article that he wrote in 2019 is kind of resurfaced a little bit today and I think the contracts the AAV kind of shows it they they came to a compromise in the year and based on what his value is he took a little bit of a pay cut so I think he wanted to be here. And I think kind of looking at what happened with Turner this year, I think the, the fans will reflect how much Noah means to this organization and the, the team as a whole. And I think he'll definitely have a better season than he did the past year. Yeah, I do too. I also think just, I think the contract year and all the new rules implemented, like all thrown at him at once, I think really weighed on him throughout the season. Uh, just the way he got rattled with, base runners and stuff, which was kind of unlike him in years past. So, you know, hopefully now the contract situation is set. Um, I know his wife's pregnant too. That probably also played a role in it. You know, I, I guess I, maybe that'll probably be a problem at times next year, you know, waiting for that to happen, some stress there, but I, I think being comfortable with the rules and having the contract situation behind him is really going to help him next year and going forward. So, you know, that is, that is pretty good, but let's take a look at, I guess, guys that will be here, won't be here. I don't know, but this is from uh, Alex Coffey of the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer. A uh, source with direct knowledge of the Phillies thinking says they are still in on the Japanese star Yamamoto. Nola was their first priority and now they are looking to bolster pitching depth. Um, so I said in the open that the timing was interesting of the NOLA deal. And it's because Yamamoto's 45 day window to what you technically like negotiate with his Japanese team or or, or something, I guess is how that works, but that opens tomorrow, uh, which makes the timing of this very interesting that the Phillies wanted to get this NOLA thing out of the way before, you know, this became a thing. I, I think that raises some eyebrows for me that, yeah, they actually still are interested in Yamamoto. I just don't know. It's not as likely now, obviously, because they're not as inclined to get into a bidding war where some of these teams are. But the thing about him is he's 25. So it's kind of like adding a top prospect in a sense, like Mm -hmm. you're buying, you know, you're buying a top pitching prospect. And this is a guy that you could pair with Mick or Andrew Painter and maybe Mick Abel. But, you know, long after Wheeler and Nola are gone. So I, I don't know where you stand on this, but. It seems like a no to me, but the fact they're still interested, obviously, is a little interesting. Yeah, so I don't, I can't find the exact tweet. Obviously, I'd love Yamamoto. I think, you know, when you kind of rank the free agent starting pitchers, I think you and I were kind of on the same agreement. It went Yamamoto, then Nola, then a drop off in Snell. I don't think either of us really had big interest in Snell um, no. if they didn't get Nola back, but. Obviously, I'd still love to add on Yamamoto. Dombrowski, I can't find the tweet. While they're they're still kind of linked interest-wise, they did kind of say that they're not going to, like, outbid people. Um, right. I think they kind of use the, the free agent pitcher budget on NOLA, which is perfectly fine by me. Um, yeah, like, it just – there's going to be teams that bid, and as nice as it would be, and we, we kind of know – that John Middleton's committed to winning. I, I don't think it just makes sense to throw like Mets money around and kind of take on that tax where it gets to the point where you're being penalized with draft picks and more 
taxable money every single year. So like while Yamamoto would be great, I don't know how practical it would be when at this point you're you're kind of looking to add depth to a, a roster that has its cornerstones at the top in terms of pitching and hitting. Yeah, uh, I agree. So it kind of sucks because I think it would have been exciting to bring in this electric Japanese star. You know, the Phillies have never – who was it? Was it this – it might have been from this article. The Phillies have never signed a – you know, done this whole negotiation thing with the Japanese team before. Uh, Chan Ho Park, right? He was on like the 09 team or something. I believe I, so. as a as a like a back end starter slash long man or something. I believe so. Yeah. Um, you know that that apparently was cited as the only like of Japanese origin player the Phillies have ever had or something. I I, I don't think that's true, but uh, hey, you know one, about one of the so Taguchi. Oh yeah, okay. So, oh, from the Kyle Kendrick thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, I forgot about that actually. <laughs> That's funny. But, um, outside of Yamamoto though, too, I, I don't. I saw now all of a sudden a bunch of talk between Sony Gray and the Braves popped up on Twitter. Um, you know, Jordan Montgomery is still out there. And there's some like lower, like not really lower level level guys, but like Erod too. And I, I just don't know if they would still go after them. And then there's the really interesting trade market where you pretty much have four like number ones available: mm-hmm. Dylan Cease with the White Sox, Cor- Corbin Burns with the Brewers, Shane Bieber with the Guardians, and Tyler Glasnow with the Rays. So if you wanted to double dip, like this is the obviously the class to do it because there's yeah. so much available in free agency and the trade market. But uh, coffee kind of made it seem like if they don't get Yamamoto, you're looking at like a Seth Lugo type, you know, like a, a back end slash long man. Um, so mm-hmm. I think that's what we're looking at. But I, I do think that, and, and we talked about this when we did the perfect off season thing, because we both had them bringing in two starters was our whole problem was game four of the NLCS last year where the second Chris Sanchez got into trouble, he got pulled and it forced you to use up your solid bullpen arms early. And then, you know, Craig Kimbrell had to come into that game at that spot and it screwed them while Taiwan Walker was making 18 million to clap on the top step. So, uh, you know, we both do, do want to, I just don't know now unless they trade, walker and get out of his contract i don't know how they could realistically get another one unless you trade for burns or glass number in the last year of their deals and then you're kind of like we're just doing it for the year and we're not giving this guy long-term money yeah i mean burns burns is just so interesting because it's not even like like if you're kind of looking at the hitters more so like a, a trout you can say hey we'll take on that contract and give up less in terms of prospect capital but like corbin burns is on the last year of his arbitration deal so he's legitimately making like maybe i don't even know like somewhere in the single millions like less than 10 million i think yeah i could be wrong yeah but they got in a fight over like three hundred thousand. yeah remember yeah, that's why right. the whole thing started yeah but like you, you can't even do that. So like you'd have to give up a lot in terms of prospect capital. So like they, it's still on the table. Like they have the prospects to get it done, but it's mm-hmm. just a matter of, do they want to, to jeopardize the, the farm system that's just kind of getting back on its feet. And I mean, we can see Abel at some point this year. I don't think obviously he definitely wouldn't help as much as a, a Corbin Burns would this year, like a Corbin Burns is a legitimate number one, number two mm-hmm. guy. But um, yeah, they, they definitely have the capital to get it done. But like, I think we'd probably be, like you said, looking at a, a Seth Lugo type signing, or I don't know, even our Michael Lorenzen, bring Lorenzen back. Yeah. If that's Because like the, the thing that I was thinking with the rotation is we're kind of at the point where we were last year, where it's like you have, a good number three, like a top three that you trust. Walker is what he is. He'll win a bunch of games in the regular season and they're all going to be equally as painful. Right. Um, you hope he takes a step forward. I don't really know what 
a step forward for Tywin Walker looks like at this point in his career. It's not like he's uh-huh. a rookie or a young guy anymore. Like once upon a time, he was a top prospect. So like the, the potential is there. And at times the stuff looks really good. But if you can't trust him in a postseason when he's making 18 million, I don't know when you're going to magically trust him the next year. And then like we, we saw Chris Sanchez look really good in September and even his October starts look good. But we saw the same thing with Bailey Falter in 2022. And then April came around this year and he blew up. So, like, I think Sanchez is a little bit better than Falter. And Mm -hmm. whereas Falter had bad postseason starts, Sanchez, I thought, looked pretty good in the playoffs. So, like, I I definitely trust Christopher Sanchez more than I trusted Bailey Falter. But, like, you you do run that risk of the young or inexperienced guy kind of blowing up in your face again and all of a sudden you have four starters and you're like yep Michael Plasmeyer's our triple A depth piece in case stuff hits the fan again like it did this past year right um I so I have like two takes on that uh first one was when they kind of in my opinion punted in a sense at the deadline this past year I I pretty much said like okay I'll live with this but I, you now kind of loaded up your farm system. I want you to be more aggressive when the opportunity, yeah. you know, comes up. And here is an opportunity for them. I, I don't know if they will. I think maybe you cross your fingers. I don't think all four of these guys would – all four are getting traded this offseason. I just don't think that's – I don't think there's enough landing spots. If you also count Yamamoto, Snell, Sony Gray, Montgomery, Erod, blah, blah, blah. There's so many guys out there. I don't think all mm-hmm. four get traded. You – you know, you could wait around until the deadline uh, this this upcoming season and add a Burns or a Glass now, and the price will go down. And for you, it is, yes, just a two-month, well, hopefully a three-month rental that you're, is going to help carry you, you know, to get a ring, kind of like, you know, the Rangers did with a bunch of guys this year. You know, just something like that. I, I think that is maybe the most realistic outcome here is that, they'll ride with this rotation through July. And then when the prospect value of these guys goes down and you're not looking at a long-term financial commitment either, where you're just going to, you know, let the guy walk at the end of the season. I, I, I think that's kind of the most realistic thing. And honestly, I'd be fine with it, but I do think that you, you probably need another horse out there because Braves, obviously the lineup's going to be good. They're going to, they're going to be back. The, Dodgers are going to be back and they're definitely going to make some noise this off season. That whole mm-hmm. thing that came out with, they want to sign Otani and trade for trout. I mean, I, you know, like these teams are going to be loaded on offense. So I think just it, the more star pitchers you can have, the better going into the playoffs. And just thinking like kind of this, this whole day with Noah, it's, it's interesting. Normally, I mean, aside from Otani, you can definitely make the case that Aaron Noah is the biggest free agent on the market. Mm -hmm. Um, like outside of Otani and the big dominoes never fall first. So I think part of it was like you mentioned, the Braves were really starting to make some, some hot pursuit in terms of them wanting Nola. And it it makes sense, you know, with Rick Kranitz there and kind of going back and that the connections to Nola's best season of his career. And he's familiar with the division. So I think the Phillies kind of, went in to handle that first and now it's kind of a waiting game like okay if you're just comparing apples to apples you have the Phillies with Wheeler, Nola and Ranger versus the Braves with Strider, Freed and Morton I guess and it's like okay how does that match up in the playoffs well now if the Braves go get a Sonny Gray or Jordan Montgomery do you still like your three versus their three or in the case of a if it's an NLCS type of series do you still like your four versus their four if they go add a sunny gray where now morton's their number four instead of their number three and that's when the phillies might pivot to a move in the offseason or at the deadline to kind of go apples to apples and match them kind of arm for arm in terms of what a potential series down the line would look like yeah definitely all right so we'll we'll see what happens with the pitching uh one other little interesting thing to get at but uh tim kelly of phillies nation had this i don't know this has been talked about for like weeks now but phillies bryce harper reportedly expected to discuss a potential extension um 
yeah, I, I, I don't know what I mean. We're already we're talking about a deal that already takes a guy to age thirty nine, and I love the guy, and I know the the move to first base will help him, but I know the injuries have all been weird, but they've all happened. Is the thing like I knew he got hit in the face, he got hit in the thumb, you know, he tore out his elbow thrown from the outfield. Like these are weird injuries. It's not like every time he runs, he pulls up his hamstring or something, but I, I, I just, I don't know what the point of this really is. Like it works. Then the guy till he's like, it, it, does he think he's like, I just keep thinking of Tom Brady. Like um, he's just going to play till he's 45. Like I, if, if it's 2029, 2030, uh, you know, towards the end of this deal and he still is playing like at a high level, then I'd be like, okay, maybe add two more years. And, you know, they're probably not as good, but they're at least, you know, he's playable and hopefully has a couple rings by then and everyone still loves him. You know, it'll be fun to still have him. I just, I don't really see the huge point uh, to doing this right now. Yeah. I mean, if we're kind of ranking extensions of guys, that are on like the roster right now, I'd probably go Wheeler one. Yeah. And then probably Stott two. Yeah, and then like Marsh, I think, even though yeah, they think I, he's a platoon player. I, I, yeah. Like Harper is <laughs> n- near the bottom of what needs to be done in terms of extensions on this team. Right. Like I get the logic behind it because the, the AAV is what goes against the tax. So like mm-hmm. I don't know if he if if it's him like oh when that clip of Middleton came out and they're like dude you're underpaid and they're like <laughs> okay well then pay us more but like the the only logic and this isn't even logical but like the only extensions like hey like Bobby Bonilla and like fifteen years and like divert the money to the back half and yeah. like just take the AAV from what's already a steal at what like a little bit over 25 million a yeah, year. It's like 26 and, like, and a half to 27 or something like that. If you're somehow able to like take that down to like 20, but it's like not possible unless you're doing like a, an, a seven year extension for like 15 million. Like you're giving him basically for every year that gets added on, here's an extra 2 million. And you're right. like, I, I don't know. It just, it doesn't make sense unless you're somehow moving money around. That's basically going to become like a Bobby Bonilla type contract because mm-hmm. like, like you said, I don't know, like the injuries aren't lingering. Obviously the, the back that occasionally flares up for him is a little bit worrisome, but at the yeah. same time when he swings as violently <laughs> as he does every time, like you're going to have a back issue here and there and that's fine. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, but I'm all for having Bryce Harper here until he like doesn't exist anymore. Like, I don't want, like now that the Vegas team is a thought, I know he's kind of shut those rumors down, but we've all kind of seen how he draws to the Vegas guys, like the, the Stotts and the Jeff Hoffman's and the, even the Brandon Workmans of the world that, and that Chris, come in from, and Chris Bryan, even, you know, yeah. Like how, how he reps Vegas and how he draws those guys in. So like now that that team is confirmed and going to exist in 2027 or whatever, like I'm all for locking Bryce Harper up for as long as possible and making sure he doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Um, but it just doesn't make sense in terms of practicality. No. Yeah. I don't know. It feels more, and I, I think the other thing is, I think they 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 need to win a World Series or two if they do this because if they yeah. don't win and they're dragging his forty something year old ass out there every day, like it's actually gonna piss people off. It, it is. Yeah. Uh, so, you, yeah, me. Piss you off? Oh, it, it will piss me off. But um, yeah, I, I I'd rather this be with you know, it, it's a lot easier. And I'm I, like I said earlier, it's a lot easier to stomach these older guys playing not so great baseball if you they've given you a couple praise or something beforehand, you know? Yeah. So yeah, for sure. I, I just, I think, think this kind of the nucleus that they have is off to a great start in doing that. You know, they brought the playoffs back and two NLCS appearances, but kind of like I talked about on the last one, like the time for 
for good seasons when you make it to like you lose to lesser teams is is over and it's when you're building this core and signing guys and kind of taking on these longer contracts to lower the money now so you can go sign more guys and build mm-hmm. the complete roster like you have to you have to get to the point where those parades are happening yeah well we will uh keep you know keep an eye out for anything that happens with i was actually surprised this happened because usually you're kind of quiet before like right around thanksgiving they wait for it yeah. to end things go crazy with the winter meetings then like you know, yeah even when christmas the, the new tweet, year's comes around they shut it down the, again yeah the original tweet today said that like though they're confident they'll get it done before the winter meetings and then all of a sudden it's like well, that was out at 11 o'clock before the winter meetings. I didn't realize that meant a half an hour later. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, that is pretty much what happened. But, yeah, so uh, we'll keep an eye out, see what the Phillies do. Obviously, the left field spot's technically opened. Um, For Mike Trout. Yeah, so we're going to see. I think keep an eye on where Shoei Otani goes because I think that no matter what Mike Trout says, that is going to play a factor. And, one, if he asks out, or not, and two, where he could potentially end up. So Dude, if he asks, if he asks out, he's it just makes too much sense for him to come here. But yeah, I mean, we we've talked about it. And I I don't want to drag this on for another fifteen minutes, but pretty much the teams that would take him are like the Rangers. You're not going to trade him in in your division. The Dodgers, you don't want to trade him there. You know, the Yankees are the Yankees. No one wants to send their generational player there. Um, you know, in That's terms of building, yeah, in terms of teams that would actually take on the contract you wouldn't have any problem sending them to he'd be happy there it's pretty much the phillies and no one else maybe the maybe the red Sox, but that's pretty much it and they like we've had good trades with them in the last few years that's true (laughs) we actually have traded with them a decent amount moniac they got moniac and el hockey two cornerstones for them yeah, it, that, you know, that's so funny that they made two separate trades with them on, like, the same day or whatever. That was just weird. But We were all, we were all so happy after the Marsh row hoppy, and it's like, oh, yeah, we didn't get Cindergaard. Let's go. And then they got Cindergaard <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I, again, we're going to drag this on. But um, I remember just seeing at first, like, like oh, hoppy to the Angels, and we thought it was for Cindergaard. Yeah. I know my brother and yeah, I we thought were, that we, we were, were flipping happy. out. But yeah, uh, we yeah that, happy. That, that was pretty funny. I didn't really know who Brandon Marsh was at that time, honestly. I just knew his MLB the show card was sick. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to do it for this one. Uh, we will obviously be back if there's anything crazy that drops. I, I don't know, like a, a Josh Harrison bench type signing, you will not hear from us. I'm just letting you know right now. But uh, they should bring good. him back. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully not. Uh, that's going to do it for this one. We'll see you guys next time.